Welcome to this episode of the Structural Engineering Channel podcast, a podcast focused on helping structural engineering professionals stay up to date on technical trends in the field and to help them succeed in their careers and lives. I'm your co-host, Alexis Clark. I work in Hilti's North American headquarters as the product manager of our chemical anchoring portfolio in the US and Canada. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Texas. I received my bachelor's in civil engineering from UT Austin, and I'm currently an MBA candidate at Auburn. I'm your co-host, Matt Picardle, and I'm a licensed engineer at DCI Engineers, practicing on structural projects in California. And I got my undergraduate degree from Cal Poly Pomona and a master's in structural engineering from UC San Diego. In this episode, we talk to Drew Dudley, P-E-S-E, Vice President at Dudley Denim Engineering and a lecturer at Texas A&M University about the state of structural engineering and higher education. He is a passionate entrepreneur, professor, and structural engineer with a hunger for learning, a calling for teaching and mentorship, and motivation to make the world a better place. Drew is a licensed professional engineer in Texas, North Carolina, Virginia, New York, Oklahoma, New Mexico, Arizona, Georgia, Maryland, and Florida, and is also certified as a Model Law Structural Engineer, or MLSE, by the National Council of Examiners for Engineering and Surveying, or NCEES. In 2020, he won the National Society of Professional Engineering, NSPE, Young Engineer of the Year Award for the state of Texas and the Brazos chapter, and is part of the Engineering News Record, ENR, Top Young Professionals of 2019. Now let's jump into our conversation with Drew. Drew, welcome to the Structural Engineering Channel podcast. Hey guys, glad to be here. Glad to have you with us. Uh, we just told our audience a little bit about your background, but if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit more detail about your career journey and then ultimately what it is that you do today uh, on a day-to-day -day basis at Dudley Dunham Engineering. All right, sounds great. Um, so I'll start out, I got my undergraduate at the University of Kansas. Um, and I'm going to talk about co-ops and internships, but unfortunately, I was a student athlete, played football at Kansas, so I didn't have an opportunity uh, during the summers to do a summer internship, um, except after I graduated, I did do one at Turner Construction, where I got to work on uh, Children's Mercy Park, where Sporting Kansas City plays in Kansas City. Um, but then, I, at that point, I knew I was going to go ahead and get my master's. I had been accepted in at Texas A&M, um, so that's where I went to go get my master's in civil engineering with a structural em emphasis. Um, and while getting my master's, I was able to get a uh, co-op position with Schultz Engineering, which is a civil engineering firm. Um, and that's not because I didn't try to get it with structural, um, just wasn't able to you know, make it work at that time. Um, but I think I learned a lot um, working for Joe Schultz at the civil engineering firm. Um, one, you know, like even today, that's useful information because their drawing sets look completely different from a structural engineering drawing set. Um, there's lots of different conventions. Uh, when they draw sections, they have different vertical scales versus horizontal scales. Um, so just being able to understand that um, is useful. Um, I did do a summer internship with, during my master with Burns McDonald, where I was in their transmission and distribution group. Um, and that was, uh, we were doing substation design and also a transmission line doing foundations for those. Um, but I had my eyes set on working at uh, Walter P. Moore. They were heavily involved in the department at the time, um, and still are. And they, uh, they had done uh, Cowboy Stadium, where, uh, Reliance Stadium, where the Texans play, and they also were involved in our capstone course. So I knew a couple of their people. So I was lucky enough to land a position there. And the first job that I got my feet wet on was the renovations to Kyle Field, which is a $500 million renovation in addition uh, to the football stadium there. Uh, and that was, it was fast track steel construction. Um, probably never will be on another project like that in my life. Literally, um, I was reviewing the shop drawings while designing, you know, the very next section, which is going to be attaching into. That's how fast track it was. And there was a lot of design that was done in the submittals, which is what you're not supposed to do. But that's how it happened, <laughs> just how fast, you know, that project went. Um, also, I got to work uh, on the KDISD football stadium, which is a cast and plays concrete stadium um, in Katy, Texas. Um, got to work on a very cool natatorium project, so indoor swimming pool uh, for Cypher ISD. 
Um, and it's kind of relevant to what we're doing now because we're doing a pretty large mass timber project. But on that one, that had eight foot deep blue lamb beams that were spanning over the natatorium with tongue and groove decking. So that was really my first heavy timber experience. Um, and then I also got to do some K through 12 um, middle schools, high school, stuff like that. Um, so I was at Walter P. Moore for about four years, um, and then I went and worked for a smaller firm. And at that firm is where I learned how to do conventional wood framing construction because, you know, at Walter P. Moore, we didn't really, we did masonry, but we didn't touch cold form steel or wood. Um, so got to do that. Uh, also, that's where I learned multifamily construction, uh, doing garden style, podium, wrap style, apartment living. Um, and then in 2017 is when I started Dudley Engineering on a hope and a prayer. Um, didn't have a client. Um, really started out with home builders um, doing foundation design uh, for custom homes. Um, and again, I got to give a shout out to Joe Schultz because uh, as a as an established civil engineering firm in the market, um, he was referring me. You know, telling guys, you know, there's another structural engineer now. Um, and so he got us on some bigger projects and, you know, just slowly built our way up from there. Um, and, and the beginning of this year, we uh, acquired the structural division of Dunham Engineering. And so that's why it went from Dudley Engineering to Dudley Dunham Engineering. Um, and with that, we've brought in fire stations, um, a lot more K through 12 design, uh, auto dealerships on top of the commercial and multifamily stuff that we were already doing. And as I mentioned, even now, we've got our largest product to date, which we're really excited about. It's a $32 million community center called the Oscar Johnson Community Center that's gonna be done with cross laminated timber. Um, so really looking forward to that, um, getting an opportunity to work on that one and keep expanding you know, uh, the type of products that we're working on. Um, so that's kind of how I got to where I am now. Um, and we're actually in a great position at Dudley Dunham right now, we've got a great team. Um, and some of these guys, we were fortunate when we acquired the Dunham division that came with us and other people I've been working on for years. I know that Alexis, you know, okay. Um, so okay and I, uh, when I was working at Walter P. Moore, he was an intern at Walter P. Moore. And I have stayed in contact with him. I probably reach out to him every six months for the last four years. Um, just trying to work on him, you know, like, okay, I think it'd be great if you came and joined me. I think it'd be great. Um, and and uh, somehow I fooled okay. <laughs> and he moved from Dallas down to College Station. But I think he's loving it. And to be honest, like he it's, he's doing great. Um, so he's already been he's been here a little over six months, and he's been promoted to a team lead position. And we have another young engineer, Ryan Sabruch, uh, who also got promoted to there. So at this point, I am not a project manager on any of our projects. Um, these team leads, they manage their group of people. Um, and we're about 15 people total. Um, but at this point, I'm primarily the principal in charge on a lot of these projects. So I do do the final reviews. Um, you know, they come ask me questions, um, but I, it allows me to focus more on business development. Um, I focus a lot on our typical detail library because I do the reviews. So I see, you know, if we have repeat mistakes, let's go fix it in our template because that's probably where it's happening. Um, that way we can, you know, knock down on those, but that's where I'm at right now. Um, and yeah, I've got a great team with us and I couldn't ask for anything better right now. We just, we need more time because we're all pretty young. Yeah. That's not a bad thing though. I, I will say of all the things I'm very very thankful that OK is in a great place and that obviously he's kicking a lot of butt. I'm just disappointed he's no longer with us in Fort Worth. Um, but uh, he's no fool. So you must have given him a really tempting offer to get him to come down there. And it sounds I'm, I'm looking forward to learning more about um, what you guys have down there. That's kind of whatever the secret sauce is that's bringing in all these fantastic, talented engineers. But I am I'm, I'm just fascinated about the breadth of not only structural engineering project types and different materials that you've had an opportunity to design with, but also even the the, the breadth of information you have about civil engineering, having had all those different, you know, being having some time in construction and having some time um, with with residential and all these different, you know, facets of the engineering and built environment that are probably make you a better engineer because you have a respect for those different aspects of a project. Mm -hmm. And if I would add to that, the other thing that I think is pivotal is my dad is a general contractor. He's a commercial general contractor. So I grew up from the age of 12 working as a laborer and estimating. Um, so I, and I also teach in the construction science department at Texas A&M. 
and I, I think that makes me a better structural engineer. My mentor at Waltz B. Moore, Bart Miller, focused on this. Like even on most design bid build projects, it's kind of the design team and the contractor are naturally pitted against one another. But at the end of the day, we're trying to get a successful building build. If the contractor is successful, that's going to mean that we're successful. Um, so we really push that attitude. And I think it helps that you know, my whole life I've been hearing uh, my father complain about engineers that, you know, don't work with them when they come into a problem on a project. Um, so we try to take the, the mentality of let's try to reach a solution, um, you know, not dig our heels in. Absolutely. Yeah, it sounds like a great career path too and great lessons. I know, you know, I'm always uh, like what your mindset is for the contractors. That's, that's always great because like you said, end of the day, everyone's trying to get things done and the more uh, everyone can come together and try to help, others solve each other's problems. Uh, everyone learns a lot and everyone's successful. Uh, Drew, I did want to switch over to uh, some of the ASCE SEI committee work. I know you're a part of that and specifically the, the Board of Governors, they formed a committee for the reform of structural engineering education. I believe it's also called CROSSE. Can you tell us more about what that is and what exactly uh, CROSSE is focused on? Yeah, I'd love to. And I, I'll probably butcher some dates and, you know, I won't get the exact quote, but we can probably put a link. They have a document that's out, um, which puts all this up there. But essentially, they're fo they're, they, in 2013, they came up with their 20 year plan. So in 2030, 2033, this is where they think the industry needs to be. And um, they focus on a few things, education being one of them. There was education, licensure, technology, globalization, innovation and leadership. Um, so these are the facets of the industry that we need to focus on because our, our industry is changing. Obviously, the technology is changing quickly. Um, I, I mentioned fast track, but, you know, fast track wasn't really a thing 50 years ago. And now it seems almost commonplace that we're doing projects like this. Um, so what, what, I, and what I have focused on is the education one. Um, because I don't know, maybe it's because I'm in a college town. Um, I'm fairly passionate about it. I teach in higher education. Um, but their main point that they're pushing for education is that over time, the universities have become much more research dominated. And I'm going to talk about this later, but research is, is extremely important um, to what we do in the industry because it pushes the envelope on the existing materials and system we have. So we understand them better. We can analyze them, uh, you know, with less conservatism built into it. And they also create new materials, right? And that's extremely important. But at the same time, we've got to have people that understand what we have now and know how to apply it to a construction project. Um, and in higher education, there's just a strong emphasis for most of these tenure track faculty. They've got to bring in research dollars, research grants. They've got to bring this stuff in. And there's not a lot of focus um, on how good of instructor they are. Um, so the instruction in my in my ex personal experience, and again, I talked to about eight other structural engineers coming into this interview because I wanted to make sure that I was not in a bubble, you know, because I had my own personal experience. at a healthy exercise. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, and me and OK, we talk about it and everyone in the office. But again, we could be in a vacuum. Um, so we talked to, I know everyone's probably familiar with Renz Hayes uh, out of Boston. So, you know, on the other side of uh, the, uh, the country, and he had a similar experience. Um, you know, it's not exactly the same, but he agreed with most of the points um, that I brought up. But, and my, uh, I guess my solution and SEI has also come out with the solution and that Croce document is that we need to start introducing more adjunct professors. And by adjunct, they mean experienced design professionals, people that are practicing PEs. Uh, into the industry so that there is that, that the practical knowledge along with pushing the research envelope. Is uh, cause I'm trying to picture that too, because I've been to, you know, the school systems too. And is there like, because our schools, universities mostly focused on research, I guess, how would we bring in like adjunct professors? I'm kind of wondering how we would incentivize that for, for universities, because I'm I'm guessing there's a reason why I'm guessing they, you know, they make money from the research, et cetera, but how do they get adjunct professors to, I guess, want to work? 
It is a great question, and I've been in higher education now for six years. Before I taught at uh, Texas a and I taught at the University of Houston, um, and six years in, I still don't really know the answer to that question. <laughs> I went and had lunch with my department head uh, to pick his brain, and he explained it to me, but, you know, it's still, I don't know if it's sunk in completely. I just know, like, he re-emphasized that that is a huge part, because um, some of it, you know, like, when a student pays tuition, a lot of that does go to the university level, not the individual department or college. And then they get some of that back, but they've, there's a big gap that they have to make up um, and they have to fill that gap with research. Now, I do think that there are situations, like in my situation this semester, I'm teaching a class of 200 students. Um, and I won't go through, go through like what you know, the, the tuition rate is, but I, I, it's fair to say they're probably doing pretty good off of me. Um, and that's one thing that I will talk about is as, as an adjunct faculty, I do make it a priority. And by that, I mean, if I have a work commitment that ha comes up and it interferes with my class, you know, I'll tell them I can't make that commitment. I treat it just as similar as I would a client. Um, but I have seen that be abused um, at the different institutions I'm in. And it's natural because um, work, you know, usually is going to take precedence. So there is a lot of canceling classes or, you know, having to somebody substitute in. So you kind of get off track on the lesson plans. But um, so I think I, I don't think that adjunct professors like it's a you, you fit them in and it automatically it works. It's got to be people that can make a commitment to it and that are passionate about it. Um, but I, 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 and I say, again, I, I would talk to Renz, um, talk to all the other engineers I talked to. Most of us had one practicing engineer in our experience through higher education. And a hundred percent of us said that was our favorite professor that we had. Now I'm talking to practicing engineers, so we're going to be biased, right? If I talk to somebody that is focused on research, they may say it was one of the tenured faculty that was also focused on research, but I don't, and again, I don't know the exact breakdown, but I would get, it's probably 90% of us going to practice, 10% stay in research. So I have to ask, you mentioned that you are teaching a class of 200, which to me does not sound like an upper class, upper level course. It sounds like a more introductory or intermediate course. Is that correct? Or what course no, are you it's, teaching? It's a senior level course. Um, yeah. students? Yeah, it's, I don't, I don't know if it was the Corona, you know, that led into this. <laughs> More um, online, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but usually it's about 100 students. Um, so I don't, I don't okay. know uh, what happened there. But yeah, 200 students this semester. So where, where is that? Where's the vision? I, I completely agree. And I think that there is a total value to having practicing instructors in in the undergraduate level. Um, you teach an upper classroom course now. Do, is that where you kind of see that where this, this difference in experience could be most complementary to the existing lectures that are already there? Or is it at the upperclassmen level? Do you see where there's opportunities throughout the entire engineering degree plan where this could be beneficial? How would you, how would you want to put those two together to where they're complementary? Yeah, and that's, that, that was one point where when I was talking to these eight other structural engineers where we did kind of differ because um, and there's even one who only had an undergraduate, didn't get a master's. And so that was a good perspective for me to get because when I was thinking about it, I'm focusing on a master's level. Um, but his thing was he wishes that, you know, we, t we can take a civil engineering degree with a structural emphasis, but you still probably have to take wastewater you know, circuits. There's a lot of other general engineering classes that you still take. Um, and basically what he was saying is he wishes that he could have focused, you know, taken some master's level courses, if need be, that focused on structures. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, I don't disagree with that. I will say that uh, SCI has explicitly addressed that in the same document I'm talking about, and they do not recommend pulling structural engineering out of civil engineering. Um, so I don't necessarily agree with that, but I haven't heard their reasoning. Um, for that, and I'd be willing to listen to it, and but yeah, you know, it's I I I, I don't know where that uh, that's coming from. That's fair. I I have um, had different exposure to ASCE and SEI as two separate entities at both you know the state and national level, and I think uh, part of the SEI vision that is shared with uh, NCSEA and Case. They're all looking to, you know, to, to develop a similar vision. And so I, I couldn't tell you what the reasons are myself, but I do know that when they spend, you know, years developing these visions, they're, they're trying to do what's best for the industry. So I'm, I'd be curious to know what the reasoning is myself. Mm -hmm. 
and I guess an example at the master's level I would give, um, the one class that, the one class I made a B in in my master's, so maybe that's why I'm holding a grudge against it, but advanced mechanics of materials, where we learned about tensors. And to be honest, I still don't know what a tensor <laughs> is, which is probably why I got a B in that class. Um, but I've never heard tensor in practice. I don't think I'm gonna use a tensor. Uh, so that's an example of I wish that there was more of a practical focus and maybe the solution there is at the master's level, you allow people to take more of a practice versus a research path in their career. And some institutions do have this. You can get a master's of engineering or a master of science. Um, but even the master, I did a master's of engineering. I still, you know, had to take advanced mechanics and materials, um, which to me wasn't beneficial to my career. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that, Drew. So for me, I'm in the West Coast, and I definitely see both sides because I got my undergrad. I actually got my undergrad at one of those uh, at Cal Poly Pomona, and they kind of have like a brand of, you know, we train, their mindset is training engineers for the industry, and, and they do. A lot of our professors, they were required to have their PE, so you couldn't teach at Cal Poly uh, if you didn't have your PE, if you weren't working at least a couple of years in the industry. So from that point of view, it was really practical. You know, all of our like wood, concrete, steel classes, we were designing things for code and we had design projects all the time. But then when I went to my master's, I definitely saw that side of very theoretical. Like I didn't, I was there for like three quarters in, I didn't design a single beam. It was a lot of, like you were saying, the tensors. That's why I laughed at that because I was still like, what's a tensor? And then, yeah, going through all that stuff. But it was like, uh, definitely don't regret it because you do get to see all the theory and the reasoning behind the codes because the codes come from the research. So uh, really great, just getting both sides of it. But uh, yeah, but if you just went to a theoretical school, I could definitely see where uh, you know, you, you might lag behind, especially in terms of if you go into a firm, a lot of training, a lot of self-studying to, mm -hmm. to get caught up with everything. So I think, yeah, if more schools could do that. I don't know how they do that. I think that's a big question. But I you know there, there are some schools that are currently doing that, but they're not common at all in the industry. Right. So. We can and get, piggybacking on that, I would yeah. say, like, like if I was going to say, what items would I want included in a more practical course? Um, one thing that I find that most, let's say, 90% of graduating engineers and even some practicing engineers don't really understand diaphragms. And diaphragms are greatly important to load path. Um, so those are the two that I kind of hung on to. And when I was asking all these other structural engineers, you know, what did you learn about diaphragms uh, when you were in college? Because again, from my personal experience, I can tell you, I never heard the word. And when my principal asked me after I had done my first uh, ETABS model doing a lateral analysis, you know, like, what did you do for the chord forces in your diaphragm? Uh, say what? <laughs> I, like, I didn't know either one of those words that you just said. Um, and then the other one is load path. So I know I heard the word load path, um, but I don't think that we focused on it enough because to me, that's one of the more fundamental things that we do is follow that load path till eventually it gets down into the earth, especially when we're looking at interfaces between different materials. So we do look at load path in like steel class, like we look at steel connection design, right? How do you transfer it from the beam to the column? but we don't ever look at how do you transfer that shear force out of your steel deck into your CMU shear wall. You know, and that level of detailing um, and making sure that you, you have a continuous load path, that was not covered. And that's something that I wish was covered because we focus hard on that with bringing in our new graduates and interns. That's kind of our crash course is load path and diaphragm because that's where you can have big mistakes, right? If you're not following that stuff. Yeah, I definitely agree. Do you know what, so I guess what are some things that they're trying to do or trying to implement in terms of, um, you know, getting this uh, across maybe, are there any like measures or actions that the committee is trying to take uh, that they're running into problems or, cause I, I know it's like, I wish we could have it, but then that's always the big question, right? How do we properly mm -hmm. implement it? What are we trying? Um, do you have any suggestions on what uh, uh, what to do on that? 
Yeah, so I think I know the two concrete steps that they're taking right now is one is they are going to start pushing um, department heads to bring in more adjunct faculty. And number two, um, they do have a program called ASCE Exceed, um, which basically teaches you how to be a better instructor. Um, and that comes with an accreditation. Um, so I would like to see like even ABED accreditation be tied to, you know, do you have a certain number of lecturers that have this accreditation? Um, because it goes through like these are the, you know, pedagogy that really uh, the students can latch on to. Um, the third one, like I think they're going to come out with more. Um, they were supposed to come out with that in the summer of 2020. Uh, but, you know, some things happened in the world. Um, so I doubt that they really got to meet you know, as often as they wanted to. So I haven't seen that come out yet. Interesting. I have one final question about this before before we kind of uh, move on a little bit. But you you mentioned that this uh, this crossy committee was was created in 2013, and the goal was 2033. So we're coming up on 40% of our project timeline. Do you think that they've made 40% of the? Are, are we on track? Have we made 40 40% of the progress expected, or you know, do we still have a ways to make up? Are we ahead of schedule? Well, so in my opinion, I think they've hit the nail on the head. I think they've identified those two issues um, that which I think are would be very beneficial. But you know, it's, it's, <laughs> I'll go into this is my next point about, you know, uh, in education, we focus a lot on analysis and design, but not a lot on how do you get that into construction documents, which ultimately, that's all that matters. Because if it's not on the plans, it doesn't matter how good your analysis model is. So I think that they've got a great analysis. They've got a great solution. Now, how do we push this to the universities? Um, and I don't think they've come up with a solution on how they plan to do that. But I, I think ABET accreditation is where it would be the easiest because all the colleges care about that. Just a little bit. Got to get yeah. some students to the door, right? And they want yeah. that accredited engineering degree if they're going to be a PE one day. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, so in kind of can, continuing on with this conversation about a well-rounded education and what makes a really well-prepared um, engineer to, to enter the workforce. Um, I know you have a pretty strong position on the uh, integration of internships and co-op positions for college students so they, they have that experience and they get a little bit of a leg up on some of those employment opportunities. Um, in your opinion, is it better to do a co-op with one company or multiple internships with several different companies? So that's a great question. I, I think that it would really come down to a case by case basis. I would say that more often it's probably going to lean towards it's going to be beneficial to have multiple different experiences. Um, but the only reason I don't say that for everyone that's got to be the solution because um, you may just the first one you go with may be a perfect fit for you. They're doing projects that you're passionate about and their culture is just fits like a glove with you. But um, for most people, I think that one, you need to figure out what type of projects are you going to get passionate about? You know, so I wasn't passionate about doing transmission and substation design. Some people are, right? I wanted to work on big stadiums. Uh, and then I did a big stadium. And then I was like, well, that was cool. But now I'd rather be meeting the owner. Like I wanted more of an intimate level at that point. Um, so, you know, different things tick for different people. Um, and then also it's, the cultural fit is a big one. Um, I've worked uh, now at three different companies uh, full time um, and the cultures were very different at all three of these companies. Um, so that, that, and that's something that you can't, you know, it's hard uh, to see based on looking at their website or looking at their LinkedIn page, what is the culture really like, right? Because people can put out good marketing campaigns, but I think you actually have to be there for a while. And even in an interview, you know, a two hour interview, um, for both parties, it's hard to really judge if it's going to be a great fit. Um, and that's one that we are doing. In fact, uh, we're bringing in an architectural engineering student from Oklahoma State University, um, just bringing her in for one week during the winter break. Um, and I actually, I, I think I found her via LinkedIn. I saw that she was engaged in the industry, which told me, oh, man, she's passionate. Um, so I reached out to her. We interviewed her, you know, Zoom interview. Um, and we just, to get to know her and let her get to know us, um, we're doing just a one week internship, which is really just a really long paid interview is what it's going to end up being. But, um, to me, like, I think she's a rock star. So we're trying to land her, <laughs> so, you know, yes. right? but at the same time, you can't fake it for a week, right? You can fake it for an interview, but can you fake it for a week? Um, yeah. so that's my thoughts on it. 
Absolutely. I definitely get that. I, I also had a very, so in uh, kind of compare contrasting your very multifaceted internship history and, um, and the ability to kind of be at different firms. I, uh, in throughout college, you know, had my obligatory summer with TxDOT. So I worked for this, the state and that clearly wasn't a good fit. And I think I always preach that there's, uh, there's equal value in learning what you don't like as much as what you do like. Um, so, you know, I spent that summer and I learned a lot of valuable pieces of engineering wisdom and, and, th and knowledge that I wouldn't have otherwise got. Um, I went to a private international environmental firm and I learned that I really enjoyed being in a big firm, but I, that environmental engineering was not for me. Uh, and then I, I went into bridge design and I, it was the closest thing in practice and in design that I, that felt closest to home. Uh, but again, it was one more step where I said, this is, this is closer and I like where we're going here, but there's still something missing. And, you know, you eventually, it, it's important to have those different experiences because there's, there's no experience where you learn nothing. So you always come out having grown in some aspect, but having those, those different abilities to experience culture and cultural fit is something that, um, you know, our younger listeners who may not have had an internship or have had a couple um, are starting to learn about and starting to see, you know, do I, do I jive with these people? Um, does their mission, the way they like to get work done, you know, do they, stop the clock at 40 hours or do they max it out to 80, you know, and, and it depends on what you're willing to give and what is uh, most valuable to you. And for our listeners who listened to our last episode, I know uh, Drew has mentioned a couple of times, Renz uh, talked about determining what your personal values are and making sure that they align with the company that you're looking for. That's uh, always, always a good uh, reflective exercise to see if you fit with the next place that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Yep, for sure. I know. Yeah public, private, small, large companies. Uh, a lot of the cultures are di very different. So I also encourage, you know, while you're a student, try to get as many internships as you can, see what the different companies are like, because sometimes it's not, uh, it's not the, the work that you're doing. It might be like the way the environment is or the way the company culture is. So yeah, always encourage experimenting with those when you can. Uh, Drew, for for students that are looking for co-ops or internships, do you have any tips or tricks or advice that you can give them? I know it's, it's competitive, but what are some things that, uh, that could help them out? Um, so for me, I mean, I'm fairly active on LinkedIn. Um, so when I see other, especially young students that are engaged in industry and you know, they're engaged in the right things, right? They're like, they're focused on structural engineering and you can just tell that it's something that I have a passion for that one that puts them over for me. They don't have to have it because most of them don't get on LinkedIn at that point. Um, but that's definitely a nudge um, in my direction. The other thing is we always are going to check references no matter what. Um, and we put more stock usually in the references and we try, you know, let's say it's a, um, somebody who's coming from experience, not a new grad. We would like to talk to one of their coworkers um, just because most often um, their boss is not going to give you the full picture due to whatever reasons. But um, so we always try and do that. So have a good list of references that you know um, that you can rely on. Um, I, th I think that to me, that's the biggest thing. We put a lot of stock in checking, back checking the references. Obviously we do the, you know, the interview, but again, you're only meeting with somebody for a couple hours. Um, so we do rely on that for students coming out. Um, we usually talk to their professors. Um, if I can, I try to find somebody that they were in a, a group project with. Um, Cause to me, that's where the, the you know, the, the, it hits the road. Did they pull their weight? on that project or were they coasting and letting the rest of the team pull up the slack? Um, because I want the person that was, you know, at the forefront, definitely pulling their weight um, because everything we do here is done in a team environment. Um, so that's also big for us, for the new grads. I feel like we may have just had a whole bunch of listeners who all went <gasps> and like collectively took a big gas because uh, as important as it is, and we get, we get a lot of questions. I know Matt certainly does on his YouTube channel about the technical skills and the technology skills and the software skills that are needed to be uh, hireable and uh, attractive talent to be brought into a new firm. And everything that Drew just shared has nothing to do with that. It, it, it I mean, obviously you want to make sure they know how to calculate things and, and understand, you know, basic structural engineering. That's what they got the degree for. But two things I just picked up from what you said is don't burn bridges. You have to be able to communicate with other people, to work with other people, teamwork and, and having integrity in your work are huge. 
And I'm, I'm like super excited that you actually call coworkers instead of just bosses, because I think you made a very good point about, you know, your past boss may not give the full transparent picture and a coworker certainly has less on the line uh, and is probably going to be a little bit more forthcoming with information. So yeah, it's always important to make sure that you maintain your relationships and you play nice with others because it doesn't matter what firm you're in, you always have to play nice with others. And uh, to any of our listeners who are in college, you probably feel like you are in you know, this organization or you're, you're in an engineering school of 100, 500, 1,000 students and that there's tons of schools out there with engineers, but the structural engineering community across the US is still a pretty, you know, it's, it's a tight knit community and it's, it, the pond's only so big. So you've, you've got to really mind your P's and Q's and make sure that you're always leaving with a positive interaction. Well said. Yeah. And the other piece I, I wanted to thank you for is having a LinkedIn profile. Um, mm -hmm. I do a lot of, of outreach with high school and middle school students and I'm actually teaching them and like helping them get together their first LinkedIn profile and learning how to, you know, that you follow people you don't know and that you, follow, that you connect with someone who is a colleague instead of just following everyone because they're used to like a tweeting culture where you follow someone who tweets. It's, it's interesting because they haven't had to use a LinkedIn professional platform before. Um, but there is no greater time than now if you do not have a LinkedIn profile to start one and start cultivating content that is going to make you a better professional and following people that you emulate and admire and want to listen to and want to see what they're putting out there and uh, contribute your own content when you feel comfortable in doing so. Because that is, that, I mean, just like you said, I, I look to, to connect with people on LinkedIn that are contributing insightful um, comments here and there or who are posting an article that is helpful to the way I work and being a better contributor myself. So yeah, it's I an agree easy with that. free tool that you so should use to to yeah. be a better professional. In my class, I give extra credit uh, for them to set up their LinkedIn profile. And I encourage them to connect with your fellow students because that's one, I didn't have a LinkedIn profile in college. I didn't start it until really I started looking at business development, um, which is where most people kind of really get into LinkedIn uh, when they're on the business development side. But I wish I would have because most of my classmates are at potential clients. You know, they, they're working at development firms or construction firms. Um, and I wish I had done a better job, you know, staying in contact with those folks and LinkedIn's one way to do that. Absolutely. I, I do want to dispel one myth. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is commonplace, but I have heard some engineers in different, uh, industries and geographies and different companies who have been kind of told this myth, uh, whether in their company or outside of it that says that if you have a LinkedIn, it's because you're looking for a job and that doesn't have to be the case at all. Uh, Many of my colleagues will tell you I'm never leaving Hilti and I don't plan, like they're gonna have to take my job from my cold dead hands when I'm 85. I'm never leaving Hilti, but uh, I have a LinkedIn and I use it actively all the time. And I don't use it as a, an opportunity to get new jobs. And you should not feel intimidated by your employer ever to not have a LinkedIn profile because there's any sense of disloyalty to your firm. If anything, it should show, it should demonstrate to your firm that you are eager to connect with others, to build community, to learn from other firms, what is, what's working better, what's, what's not, how can we take that back and make ourselves better? Um, so if you ever feel that kind of intimidation, you should very quickly dispel that, that myth with your, with your leadership. Cause it's, yeah, a, if, it's a platform for learning. Well, LinkedIn's not paying us, I swear, but I'll plug LinkedIn <laughs> for one other thing is, you know, I mentioned these eight structural engineers. I reached out to them all through LinkedIn and that's, you know, just direct messaging and they got back to me and they got back to me very quickly. So, you know, kudos to them. Everyone in the industry is, is uh, interested in this subject. Um, but that's where I, I connected with them. That's where I usually try to identify who are other, you know, leaders in the structural engineering industry. And then I will follow them. Um, so that's also been good, but uh, we use it a lot for recruiting ourselves. Um, you know, just seeing people at other companies that are engaged, but we're very even out of those eight guys, we want to start a group, um, kind of call it a, a Google, you know, group. Um, it'll be our own little personal inch tips. Matt's probably, are you familiar with inchtips.com? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I know so, that one. Alexis, you, yeah. Yes. Familiar, yeah. not an expert. <laughs> So I do, I mean, inch tips has a lot of good information on it, but I will tell you that uh, you got to watch yourself on the internet on the project at Kyle field. We were having a dispute with the contractor on a particular issue. I posted a very generic post about this issue, 
but like anybody that's familiar with it knows which project I'm talking about. And my handle was like Texenge USA or something. Like wasn't too hard to figure out who I was. And the next morning I got an email from the contractor with a snippet like, hey, Texenge USA. <laughs> So it doesn't look the most professional when you're posting to an internet chat board about a question, <laughs> yeah, the forums. but there are smart people on there and they did post uh, some links to some documents, which kind of backed up our position, but still, yeah, just watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe be more discreet with your username yeah, when you're not on LinkedIn. More discreet with your username, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. I know it's yeah, LinkedIn free marketing, but um, it's interesting that you, not, you didn't even mention like your resume. So it's like, it kind of shows where, you know, the industry's going. Professionals are looking on LinkedIn and just like, you, just like uh, you found out, Drew, it's, you found someone that was really passionate about it on LinkedIn and you reached out to them. And even for students, I encourage them to, to reach out to, to, they can find people, professionals that they just want, want to find out about the industry because, you know, they're in a theoretical university. They don't know what it's like. It's very easy if you like find professionals and just ask for like a 15 minute uh, Zoom interview, just informational interview, just to ask them what the industry is like, what their job's like. Maybe that's even a good way to get a feel for their culture. And during the pandemic, you know, they're in their office, they're not going anywhere. So it's like a really easy ask that everyone knows how to use like Zoom now. So I also encourage students for that, but thanks for giving that insight because I think that you know, it's not just resumes anymore. It, it is your, your profile and even social media. So that's really interesting. Uh, Drew, I think that just about does it for all the questions. I know this is really interesting. I know it went on a little longer, but I think that's, I think that's great because I could keep asking more questions, but you know, uh, <laughs> we got to cut it down. But thanks so much for being on and I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank you guys. Uh, and I really appreciate what both you guys are doing. Matt, you put out great videos, which I, I push a lot of people to take a look at those videos. And obviously, Alexis, I think it's great that you're here as well. Uh, so people can see that it's not just, you know, males in the industry. Um, so I really appreciate what both you guys are doing. Thanks, you really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for joining us, really. This is awesome. Yeah. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. We'd love to hear your feedback, comments, and or questions. To leave them, please visit structuralengineeringchannel.com. There you'll find a summary of the key points discussed in today's episode, which is episode number 35, as well as any links to any of the resources, websites, or books mentioned during this episode. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Lastly, before we go, I want to let you know about EMI's new show, This Week in Civil Engineering, also known as TWICE. TWICE is a 10 to 20 minute weekly audio and video podcast hosted by practicing civil, structural, and geotechnical engineers, bringing listeners the latest in industry news. You recognize that most of us don't have the time to read up on all the news we'd like to anymore, and soon we won't have to, thanks to TWICE. Go check it out at www.twice.news. That's T-W-I-C-E dot news. And make sure to subscribe to the show to get your weekly updates. Until next time, we wish you the best in all of your structural engineering endeavors.